There we go. Mask off. Can you guys at home see okay? Uh, you can maybe put in the comments if you can see if you can read the screen and if you can see me. I know last time Chris was kind of in the dark and the screen didn't show up very well. We're working on this technology. We don't have uh, we're a small church and we don't have any tech gurus uh, here anymore. So we're doing the best we can. I'm grateful to Chris and uh, Fern for uh, doing what they're doing, and uh, hopefully you guys can hear. And see, and we're going to get started. I really, really wanted to preach this Sunday uh, about the Ohio State Buckeyes. I just couldn't yeah. find a verse. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, we uh, handed it to Clemson. Uh, and apparently, we're not the 11th best team in the country. So, uh, anyways, um, thank you, Brian, for leading us in singing. Uh, we are here at the hotel. The temperature has turned to 62 degrees. It doesn't feel quite cool yet. Um, I'm going to try and keep my jacket on, but uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the new year. Now, normally the first Sunday of the new year, you talk about resolutions, you talk about goal, you talk about vision, and we're not doing that today. Although hopefully we're all setting goals and laying things out before the Lord and telling God what we want to do this year for him and praying about it and sharing it with people, but I'm not preaching on that today. And uh, I want to actually tell the people at home uh, what verses we're going to. In case you can't uh, see what's up on the screen, you can get a head start there. Uh, we're going to look in John 11, John 14, John 20, Luke 7, and Mark 9. So if you jot that down, you're going to find out where we're going uh, as we're going. So you're uh, ahead of the curve and can turn your Bibles there. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to do a couple of sermons this year on some of the minor characters in the Bible. And when I say characters, I don't mean that they're fictional. I mean they're people that are in the stories that the Holy Spirit is telling us uh, who aren't the big folks. You know, not Peter, not Paul, not Mary, um, the, the people in the Bible, not the 60s group that sang Puff the Magic Dragon. You know, not Moses or Abraham or Esther or Ruth, who you could do a whole series on those people. You could probably talk about uh, Peter for months, uh, Paul for months. Um, but we're talking about the kind of people that you could read everything about them in one good quiet time. And today who I want to talk about is Thomas. Uh, not necessarily because that's my last name. Uh, he is someone in the Bible that it doesn't say a lot about. Now when we think of Thomas, what word, what is the first word that pops into your head? Doubt. 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 That's right. What does everybody call this guy? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. What a horrible nickname. Have any of you ever gotten a bad nickname given to you? Yeah. What? I can't say you it. You can't say it. Okay. Anybody want to share a bad nickname that got stuck on them? Stutters. Huh? Stutters. Stutters. Oh, that's sad. Kim. Oh, freshman of the freshman. Freshman of the freshman. <laughs> My son, when he was a freshman in high school, got that nickname freshman. And when he was a senior, they were still calling him freshman. Um, I had a lot of nicknames growing up. Probably the worst, um, on the very first day of baseball practice one year, somebody tried to give me a wedgie. And so from then on, I was known as Joe Wedgie or Wedge. From one incident, there's a guy by the name of Bob Crable who was a All-American football player at Notre Dame, first-round draft pick for the Jets. I haven't seen him in 40 years. If I saw him today, he would call me Wedge. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, what a lousy nickname. The word Thomas in Aramaic is the word for twin. And the word Didymus is the Greek word for twin. He was a twin, apparently. That was what they called him. Uh, we don't know a lot about Thomas. He's mentioned once only in Matthew Mark, Luke, and Acts, he's only mentioned one time in each of those books in a list of the apostles. If it weren't for John, and he's never listed or mentioned anywhere outside the Gospels and Acts, so if it weren't for the Gospel of John, we would know nothing about Thomas during the ministry of Jesus. Now, what does history tell us about him? History tells us that it looks like he traveled uh, to India, preached the Gospel in India, arrived there in the early 50s, probably in Kerala, and uh, was martyred in the early 70s. Now, 
You might think, well, what about the Gospel of Thomas? I've heard about the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was written 80 years or more after he died. Certainly wasn't written by him. It was a Gnostic text that they just stuck his name on. And uh, it has some really bizarre things. It's not a gospel at all. There's no life of Jesus, no history. It's just 114 disjoint sayings. And the very last one is this. Simon Peter said to them, let Mary go away from us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, look, I will draw her in so as to make her male, so that she too may become a living male spirit similar to you. Every woman who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Ironically, this is one of the texts that Dan Brown said was taken out of the Bible because it promoted the divine feminine. Ladies, are you feeling elevated and divine from this passage? This is just a nonsense book, has nothing to do with Thomas, but you've probably heard it. Anyways, today we're going to talk about Thomas, the value of doubt. And we're going to look at the three passages in John where we see something about Thomas in chapter 11, 14, and 20. He's also mentioned in chapter 21, but again, it's a list of the seven guys that went out fishing with Peter. You know, when he went out to catch the fish and Jesus says, have you caught any fish? And then they come back to shore and he says, do you truly love me? Uh, and Peter says, you know, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. Thomas is one of the guys, doesn't tell us much. So go ahead and turn to chapter 14 of John, and we're going to read from there. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You don't know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, there's our guy Thomas, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Wow. We can do a sermon on that, but we won't. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Well, what do we learn about Thomas here? It's the last night of Jesus' life. He's trying to explain eternal truths to the disciples. There's, from John 13 to John 20, you've got what's going on the last day of Jesus' life and, and, and the resurrection. Thomas didn't understand, so he says, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to follow you? He didn't understand. Maybe we could call him clueless, Thomas. But if we did, we'd have to call the other guys that too because they didn't get it either. Really, Thomas is asking a really good question. He doesn't understand, so he speaks up. Where, where are you going? You, we, we missed something along the way. It was a question that needed to be asked. I'm sure they were all thinking it. Go back to chapter 11, verse 11 through 16. John 11. After he had said this, that's Jesus, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. I don't think he deserves to be called Doubting Thomas. Sounds like we ought to call him Courageous Thomas because he's ready to die with Jesus. He's aware of the fact that the religious leaders have been making threats on Jesus' life and want to kill him. He's also aware of the fact that he thinks Jesus is the Messiah and he expects the Messiah to be trying to overthrow the Romans, which means that death is a very real possibility. Either way, he's courageously ready to die with Jesus. He's a man of courage. Now, let's go to the passage 
that Thomas is most known for, chapter 20 of John. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter. The background from verses 1 through 19, Mary Magdalene, early Sunday morning, goes to the tomb and she finds it empty. So she goes back to where all the apostles are staying and some of the sisters. And she tells them the tomb is empty. They've taken the Lord. So Peter and John run to the tomb. They look in. They see the empty tomb. And uh, they go back to tell the brothers, we don't know what's going on. Mary stays at the tomb. Jesus appears to her and tells her, go back and tell the brothers what you saw. And so she goes back and tells the apostles, I saw the Lord. So in verse 19, it's later that night. It's the day that Jesus rose at night. In verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. So this is the first appearance of Jesus to the apostles. And Thomas wasn't with them. Yes, he was out shopping, maybe you know, hoarding some toilet paper or something like that. I don't know. doesn't say, but he wasn't there. So Thomas called Didymus, verse 24, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I can put my finger in his side, where the, uh, my hand in the side, I will not believe it. So Thomas comes back. They say, we saw him. It's true. And he refuses to believe it because he hasn't seen it for himself. Now, for whatever reason, John doesn't record what that discussion was like and how long they argued about it. I can't imagine. In fact, the next uh, scene is eight days later. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall and find out what those conversations were like for those eight days. But now it's the following Monday. Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The NIV says, stop doubting and believe. Now, Jesus was speaking in Aramaic. So whenever we read the words of Jesus, it's there translation from what he said in Aramaic into Greek. And in the Greek, it literally says, become not unbelieving, but believing. Stop doubting and believe sums up the message, uh, but he's not telling Thomas a one-time thing. Believe what you're seeing right now. He's saying, you be a believer, be believing, be faithful. Now question, how did Thomas go from being courageous ready to die with Jesus, to refusing to believe that he rose from the dead. How did that happen? This is a guy that says, yes, I'll die for him. Jesus didn't meet his expectations. He didn't expect Jesus to die. Certainly not a criminal's death on the cross. He expected him to come and conquer. Conquer the Romans. That was what most Jews believed about the Messiah, not the shameful death of a criminal, followed by a resurrection, which nobody expected. Let's talk about the value of doubt. I want to answer a couple of questions. Number one, what is doubt? Two, where does it come from? Three, who has doubts? Four, we're going to look at two wrong ways to deal with doubt. And then last, we're going to look at the right way to deal with doubt. Well, what is it? We usually say it's an intellectual problem, something we're struggling with in our mind, but it never is really. 
It might have its roots in some intellectual things, but really our doubts are always rooted in our feelings, our emotions, something that doesn't sit right with us. We say it's intellectual, but, but it really isn't. We struggle to believe something that we already believe, or we're struggling to keep beliefs, uh, believing something, but, but it's deeper than that. Sometimes it's not even something we can consciously describe. We just have a, a feeling and we're kind of drifting away. Well, where does it come from? Doubt comes from one of two places, unmet expectations or an unwillingness to surrender. Unmet expectations or an unwillingness to surrender. Yeah, we tell ourselves that we have these intellectual problems, but we have emotions. We're hurt. We're disappointed. There's something that didn't go the way we thought it should, and doubts start to creep in, or we just realize uh, we don't really want to surrender to Jesus. Because, let's face it, that's hard. Well, who has doubts? Who has doubts? Any, anyone. Yes, everybody has doubts. Everybody not named Jesus has doubts. Do you ever feel like you were a bad Christian because you had doubts? Yes. You know, Thomas, uh, maybe we are bad Christians, but not because we have doubts. Uh, Thomas was with Jesus for three years. He saw tons of miracles. He saw us like the brothers and the sisters said, we saw Jesus, and he still doubted. Maybe he's just weak, but I don't think so. Because a few chapters earlier, he was ready to die. He was struggling. Stop doubting and believe. Does this mean we should never have doubts? Chris is shaking his head. No, I don't think so. Does this mean, uh, is, is Jesus just telling Thomas, just shut up and believe? People often misinterpret what Jesus says here. There's a strange belief by many Christians that you should never doubt and that you just need to shove all those doubts out of your mind. Have you ever met anybody who never doubted? It takes a certain kind of foolishness to never doubt anything. It means you don't use your brain. Have you heard this one? Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. Don't believe your doubts and doubt your beliefs. It's a catchy slogan, isn't it? It's not biblical. That is, in, a, in, a, in effect, essentially saying... Close your eyes, close your ears, go la, 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 I believe, I believe, I believe. Does that make you feel better? Oh, no. It doesn't. It doesn't work. When Fern was a young Christian, she had doubts. And she was rebuked for not trusting God. And she felt like she was a bad Christian. Let me tell you who's a bad Christian. Someone who won't repent. Someone who quits. Someone who stops loving Jesus. Someone who doubts. You know what we call a Christian who doubts? A Christian. Because every Christian has doubts. It's just a part of life. Thomas was one of the 12 apostles, the guy who went to die in India, and he doubted Jesus. But other great men and women in the Bible didn't have doubts, did they? Abraham never had doubts? No. He was so insecure about God taking care of him, he lied about his wife being his sister twice. Moses, the great lawgiver, was talking to the burning bush I made excuse after excuse because he didn't believe that God would help him. He argued with God. Amen. Gideon. God calls him and he says, I'm the wrong guy. I'm the last guy on the planet. So did God rebuke them and tell them, you are so stupid, you are faithless? To Abraham, he sent him angels. Moses, he says, take your staff and I'll make it into a snake and make it back into a staff. Gideon, he turned the fleece wet, then he turned the fleece dry. He gave them all evidence so that their faith would have something to stand on. God doesn't ask us to close our eyes and our ears and just go, I believe, I believe, I believe, like the cowardly lion. I do believe in spooks. I do believe in spooks. I do. <laughs> These were great men and uh, men of faith, and there's women of faith in the Bible too. They had doubts. Who is the greatest person in the Bible not named Jesus? Who's the greatest person ever to live not named Jesus? John the Baptist. How do you know that? Jesus said so. That's right. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 7. John's disciples, verse 18. John's disciples told him about these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, 
Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back to John and rebuke him for his lack of faith. No, he said, go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. The good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. It literally is saying, blessed is the man who is not offended or scandalized. Scandalizo on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury or palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he was least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The greatest person who had ever lived up to that point in time was John the Baptist. Jesus said so. And John, he, 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 think about who John is. He's the forerunner of Jesus. He's a prophet. He's the second coming of Elijah, the fulfillment of that. He's lived a life totally committed to God. He's out in the desert eating bugs and honey, and now he's in prison. He's given everything to God, and he starts to wonder while he's in prison, is this really worth it? I'm, I, I've been living in the desert. I've been eating bugs. I, I've never had a date. I, I, I'm in jail. I'm probably going to die in jail. What if Jesus isn't the Messiah? What an idiot have I been? He had doubts. The greatest guy who ever lived up to that point, And he's doubting Jesus while Jesus is there. How does Jesus answer? Rebuke him? Call him weak and uncommitted? No. He reminds him of all the reasons he has to believe. He gives him evidence. He says, deaf hear, the blind can see, the sick are cured, the dead are raised. Don't be offended because of me. Blessed is the man, is the person who is not scandalized by me. If the greatest man who ever lived have doubts, do you think that you and I aren't going to have them too? Mm. The question is not, are we going to have doubts? The question is, what are we going to do with them? Mm. Yeah. Amen. What are we going to do when we have doubts? We saw what John did. We saw what Thomas did. John sent his messengers to Jesus. Thomas expressed it to the guys. How about Peter? Remember Peter? Jesus said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When did he say that to him? Right up here, right? When he sunk. Now, wait a second. He, he, he's, he's rebuking his lack of faith for not walking on the water? That's an impossible thing. Think about it. He's not only seen Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle... He just saw Jesus on the walk on the water, and he walked on the water. Why doubt then? He said, well, why would you doubt? You did it. Peter's problem wasn't doubt. Peter's problem was that he got scared. A lot of times our doubts are rooted in our fears. We say we have doubts, really we're just afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of what might happen to us. You know, God might ask us to do something we don't want to do. What if I never get that good job that I want? What if I never get married? What if I get sick? What if I die? What if my spouse dies? What if my kids die? Fill in the blank of the things that cause you fear. And fear can cause good men and women to doubt God. But we're not really doubting God. We're, we're afraid of what God might do. 
But the fact is, everybody has doubts, so we have to get used to them. You're going to have doubts. Peter, John, Thomas, Moses, Abraham, they all had them, but they all overcame them. Now let's go back to Jesus and Thomas in chapter 20. Look what Jesus does. He gives real evidence. He says, go ahead, stick your fingers in. I'm cool with that. Stick your hand in my side. But blessed are those who don't get to do that and still believe. Now, once again, is he saying blind faith? No. He's saying you've got to believe the witnesses who did see it. See, Thomas's problem is he should have believed Mary Magdalene and the other apostles when they said we saw him. Because he had every reason to believe them. But to Thomas's credit, as soon as he saw Jesus, he didn't stick his fingers in, did he? He didn't follow through. You know, his big talk, he backed down real quickly. How many times do we talk big and then realize, you know, I shouldn't have said that. He says the most amazing statement of faith about Jesus in the entire Gospels. My Lord and my God. You know, there's lots of passages that teach in directly that Jesus is God. Right before Abraham was born, I am. Here he literally calls him my Lord and my God. Thomas repented of his doubt. Is it bad to have doubts? Is it wrong to doubt? Are they good or bad? Well, it depends. Depends on what you do with them. Is water good or bad? When you're thirsty? Very good. When you're drowning? Very bad. Doubt forces us to examine our beliefs to make sure that they're true. And when we make sure that they're true, our faith becomes Strong. stronger. Yes, doubt is necessary for faith. If you have a faith that's never been tested, never been tried, never been put through the fire, how do you know it's genuine? Yeah. Our faith has to be tested. Imagine that they never test a boat for water safeness before they put a bunch of people out in it. That'd be crazy. But doubts can be bad. Doubts can be very bad. They can paralyze us. They can make us ineffective. And yes, if we have doubts, we're in good company. But if you have had the same doubts for months or years, the problem is you. God does not intend us continually living with doubt. God wants us to work through our doubts, find out what's true, believe it, and move forward. And frankly, some things need to be doubted, right? You get emails all the time telling you stuff that you ought to doubt. You know, does anybody know who these people are? And I hope you don't. I'm glad. No one should know who these people are. I'm embarrassed to say that I do. There is a TV show that my daughter and her husband like, and so we watched it with them when they came to visit. It's called 90 Day Fiance. It's the worst brain rot on television. I love that show. Um, <laughs> yes, if you want to feel better about yourself because you want to see the worst people on earth, watch that show. But um, every time I watch it, my IQ drops a point. Um, this is a guy named David, I think, right? And Lana. David is an American with a very bad toupee. Lana is a lady in Ukraine who's been catfishing him and getting thousands of dollars from him. He kept sending her money. He went to meet. He went all the way to Ukraine to meet her. She didn't show up. So he hired a private investigator because she must have not known the right place to go. So he finds out that she does exist and that she has profiles on just about every dating site that there is while she supposedly committed to him. So what did he do? He says, well, forget her. Nope. He kept sending her money. He went back to the Ukraine, met her, tried to give her a kiss, which she kind of dodged him. Uh, just a couple tiny hints, right? You know, uh, like maybe we, she just wants to be good friends. Uh, guys, you ever had the good friends talk? I've had a bunch of them. So what did he do? After two days in Ukraine, he proposed. <laughs> Gave her a ring. I Googled this guy, and eventually he gave up on her after spending more thousands of dollars of her at, while she's ducking him and avoiding him. So what's he doing now? He's online looking for new Ukrainian women to date. Sometimes our doubts should be doubts. They're there to tell us something. God doesn't want us to believe crazy stuff like this poor fella. Um, God 
gives us evidence because he expects us to trust him. Why? Because God is trustworthy, unlike these crazy people. And they deserve our pity, um, or at least he does. She's just the scammer. But anyways, so if we have doubts, what do we need to do? We need to expect doubts, inspect doubts, and then neglect them. We got to do them in that order. Expect them because they will come. Inspect them, which means you need to address them, test them for validity, look at the facts, and then after you've done that, then neglect them. You address them, and then you move on. You don't keep thinking about your doubts after you've addressed them. It's like you pass up a sign, you see a cop on the side of the road, you know, and then two hours later, you're still looking in your rearview mirror wondering if he's following you. No, no, he didn't pull you over, you can move on. We have to face the facts, determine if our doubts are legitimate, and if they're not, then we move on. Now, why is it so important that we have to learn how to deal with our doubts? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. I'm going to give you one big one. Um, college. We only have one college student in the room, but all of it, most of us have kids that are going to go to college someday, and our children and grandchildren's faith is going to be viciously attacked in schools that you and I will pay tens of thousands of dollars for them to attend, and if our kids aren't attending them, we're paying thousands of tax dollars to our state universities mm -hmm. to have their faith attacked. If we don't learn how to face our doubts and teach the next generation how to face their doubts, the church will disappear in two generations. That's how important it is. Because I'm telling you, every non-religious university in this country will attack your faith. Why would God say that sex outside of marriage is of sin if everyone's doing it? Why would God say that men are men and women are women and men and women are supposed to marry each other when Hollywood and the university says otherwise? If we don't learn to ask the right questions and dig for answers, our doubts will turn into unbelief and we will die spiritually. Or maybe we'll barely hang on, but we'll never be strong enough to help anybody else. Doubt is a good thing, but unresolved doubt is rat poison. It's dangerous. Okay, three ways to deal with doubts. Now, you know it's always good to have a mnemonic to help people remember. I couldn't decide which one to use, so I used them both. I wimped out. You can accept them, you can avoid them, or you can address them. Or, if you like the letter F, you can follow them, you can flee them, or you can face them. Now, if someone else did this afterwards, I would have a talk with them and told them they should have picked, and I'm sure that Chris will. I, I wimped out. Number one, if you have doubts, the first wrong way to address them is to accept them, to follow them. James 1, verse 6, But he must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed around by the wind. Some people are always struggling with their faith. They're always dying. Every time they hear a challenge to their faith, they're just falling apart. I saw a program on National Geographic that said the Bible isn't true. Somebody that I love died. Someone in the church hurt my feelings, so this can't be God's church. I prayed for something and God didn't do it, so God isn't there. Fill in the blank. The Bible calls that being tossed about by every wind and wave. There's always something. These people, the ones that just follow their doubts, there's, there's a problem, I'm just going to run after it, I'm just going to struggle here, those people will not make it. They don't stay faithful very long, they will leave God eventually. Satan dangles a doubt in front of them like a worm and a hook for a fish, and they gulp it up just like that fish. People who give in to every doubt that comes along will lose their faith, they will fall away. We can't believe everything that comes along to challenge our faith any more than we should believe every one of those political ads that comes on TV. You know, it might be true that the four people running for senator are the devil uh, walking around in human clothes, but it's, and maybe they are, I don't know. But, but why would we believe everything that we hear? I, I, I'm here to tell you, you're going to get some emails that aren't true. Bill Gates really won't pay you to forward emails. 
NASA didn't really discover a missing day from when Joshua was fighting and God made the sun stand still. The Russians didn't really dig a tunnel so far down they could hear the screams from hell. All of these have been things that have been floating around. And of course, they're, they're silly. But doubt that we don't deal with in our life isn't silly. If we just run after every doubt that comes along instead of addressing it the way God wants us to, we become those weak-willed people that won't make it. We cannot accept our doubts. We cannot follow our doubts. Secondly, we can avoid or flee our doubts. And that's what a lot of Christians try and do. You just pretend that they're not real. Ignore them and just go away. Just believe. If I believe hard enough, my faith isn't strong enough. There's a thing called blind faith. That's believing in things for which there is no evidence. And I've heard people, I've heard believers say, this is the greatest faith. When you believe when there's absolutely no evidence. Where does God say to do that? When does God tell us to believe something blindly? That's not faith, that's nonsense. God gives us good reasons to believe good things. Jesus rebuked Thomas's lack of faith, not because he wanted him to have blind faith, but because he had already given him more than enough evidence to believe. Sometimes we see our doubts as evil, as sinful, and so we pre pretend they don't exist. It's like we psych ourselves up. More faith, more faith. Imagine you're laying in bed, you're a kid, and you're afraid that there's a monster in the closet. So you close your eyes really tight and you pull the covers up over your head. Does that make the monster go away? It doesn't. You know what you got to do. You get up, you go over, open the closet door, look around, and you see that there's no monster in the closet. Then you can go back to sleep and stop being afraid. You know what happens to doubts that you ignore? They come back and they bring their friends. Mm. They come back with a vengeance. And some of us deal with our doubts by ignoring them and gritting our teeth and, 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 and that, that just doesn't work. They won't go away. They'll come back later. You have to face them. You have to challenge them. Now, God doesn't owe you and me a specific answer for every question that we ask. Sometimes he's not going to tell us what we want to know, but he does give us the answers that we need. He does give us what we need. Think about this. God wants us to put our complete trust in him and follow Jesus. He's not trying to trick us. It's in his best interest to help us overcome our doubts. He will always give us what we need to overcome our doubts. It's not consistent with his, his desires to keep us in the dark. But we have to be looking for his answers. And they won't always be the same thing as our answers, will they? They might not be the ones that we want. So stop beating yourself up for having doubts. You're going to have them. Don't pretend that they don't exist. They do. It's deadly if you ignore them. My mother was afraid to go to doctors. And she didn't go to a doctor for the last 30 or 40 years of her life because she didn't want to hear any bad news. By the time we finally got her to the doctor, after 40 years of saying, if I ignore it, the problem doesn't exist, she had... AFib, she had had several strokes and she had cancer, lung cancer that had eaten through her lungs and into her ribs. And when the doctor says, well, how much pain are you in? She goes, I feel fine. He said, that's not possible. When she went to sleep, she would scream out in pain. I sat next to her bed in the hospital where she would scream out, ow, ow, ow. But when she was awake, I'm fine. If we ignore our doubts, like cancer. They will kill us eventually. It's uncomfortable to deal with them. It would have been uncomfortable for her to go to the doctor earlier and get some treatment, but she might have lived longer. There's nothing magical about believing. You know, we have this idea that if we believe something strong enough, we can make things happen. My wife likes the movie Polar Express. I I'm not as big a fan. Um, and one of the things that bugged me in the movie is this idea that belief is something magical. And if you believe strongly enough, Santa Claus exists. But if you don't believe, Santa Claus doesn't exist. You know what? Our belief doesn't make things true or false. 
Belief doesn't make things true. We need to believe in true things. Belief doesn't make things true. If I have enough faith, I can make something happen. No. God wants us to trust him so that he can make things happen. How many of us have said this? I don't have enough faith. But how much faith do we need, really? We have this uh, weird idea. The bigger my faith is, the more that God will do. And, and, and if you read some passages in the New Testament, you can get that idea if you don't read them all in context. It's not about the quantity or quality of your and my faith that matters. It's the quality of the person in whom we have the faith that matters. It's not how big is your faith. It's how big is the object of your faith. Last week, I flew to Dallas to see my new grandbaby. Uh, to save time, I didn't put a bunch of pictures in here of her, but she's adorable. How much faith did I need to f fly to Dallas? Just enough to get in the plane. Now, which is better? A little faith and a good airplane and a good pilot, or a lot of faith and a bad airplane and a bad pilot? I don't know about you, I'll take the small amount of faith in the good airplane every single time. Let's say Brian and Chelsea get together, and they say, we got this great idea for the singles this Friday. We are going to build an airplane. We're going to build a homemade airplane. And then we're going to believe really hard that it can fly. How many of you would get on that airplane? For the last flight of your life. Yeah. No. You, it, it, that's, that's crazy. Now, I, I hate flying, which is really weird because I used to skydive and I love skydiving. I, I like jumping out of planes. I don't like getting in them. Uh, I'm a nervous flyer. Fern can tell you. Sometimes I hyperventilate on takeoff. I'm grabbing the things and I'm like... And I'm praying during takeoff. Do I have to have a lot of faith? No. The guy next to me, when I flew to Texas, when I was there, uh, I'm like, and I'm just breathing. We hit that bump. He slept the whole way. <laughs> you know, we both got there equally safe. It's not about how much faith I had in the airplane. It's how safe that airplane was. You just need enough faith to get on the plane. How much faith did Jesus say we need? Mustard. The, size the size of a mustard seed. See, we just have to get on God's plane. We just have enough faith to say Jesus is Lord. To agree to love him with our heart and soul, mind and strength. To obey him as best as we can. The plane is fine. I just got to get on. God is great. He's a perfect airplane. When Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, how much faith do I need? Enough to obey his commands. That's it. If he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins will be forgiven, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Peter said, how much faith do they need to obey it? Enough to do it. That's it. We don't need a gigantic faith. Luke 17. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. When the apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith, he goes, you don't need that much. You just got to have a little bit of faith in the right things. A sufficient faith in a big, great God. Have you ever seen somebody at church they're always happy. They're fired up. They're, they want to be there. They just seem to be doing awesome. You say, hey, come on. We're going to all serve on Saturday. And they show up. And they're hugging everybody. And they're fellowshipping. And they're, they're, they're singing loud. And then one day you look around and they're gone. What happened? I say that there were feelings and doubts under the surface. They never addressed. They put on a happy face. And one day they said, you know what? I quit. Mm. You win. Don't avoid your doubts. Don't flee your doubts. The thing we have to do, lastly, is address them. Face them. If we follow our doubts, we'll die. If we flee our doubts, they'll keep coming back until we get crippled by them or follow them. The answer is to face our doubts. As we said before, expect them, express them, and address them. Otherwise, we'll obsess over them. See, if we challenge our doubts, well, we challenge our beliefs. You should challenge your beliefs, right? We should test our faith, challenge it, and then follow the evidence, then stop focusing. Then we can forget about it. 
Lots of things create doubts in our life. You meet a non-Christian who lives a really, really good life, and you think, maybe you don't have to believe in Jesus. Or God doesn't answer a prayer that you prayed fervently about. You see suffering and injustice in the world. You see hypocritical people who claim to be Christians, maybe ministers and priests who are evil, maybe people in your own church. You face hardships in life, sickness, joblessness, pandemics. But the great people of faith they dealt with their doubts differently. John the Baptist. Think about the, the pain he must have felt in prison. The hurt. Who, have any of us ever served God as fervently as John the Baptist? I know I haven't. And he's in prison. Is it worth it? So what did he do? He didn't sulk. He went to Jesus. He sent his guys. He goes, go ask him. I got to know. I got to find out. And he got an answer. And you know, we know that John stayed faithful. He never got out of prison. He died in that prison, but he died faithful. When Herod separated his head from his body, he sent his soul to spend eternity with his father in heaven. We need to talk to God about our... Whoa. There we go. Number one, we need to pray our doubts. How many of you have ever written scripture? How many of us are authors of the Bible? Anybody? Written scripture? No, written them. No, I'm sorry. I write them out. In my oh, you write them out. No, I mean, I've been an author of scripture. I should ask it more clearly. None of us are an author of scripture. Think about the Psalms. These are prayers to God that God had these people write them down to be in the Bible. Did you ever read some of the crazy things that they say in their prayers to God? They complained. They accused God. They celebrated the death of children. A lot of wrong things that God did not approve of were written in these Psalms. Why? Because prayer is how we get real with God. The guys who wrote those Psalms... Uh, uh, told God about their doubts. And why not? God already knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. You're not going to weird him out when you say, God, I just, I don't think you exist. God, I don't think you love me. God, I don't think anybody loves me. Whatever it is, tell. He let the psalmist, he says, you guys have some weird things going on in your head. Write them down so Christians 3,000 years from now can learn from them. To learn how to pour out their hearts to me even if it's something wrong. You know, back in the 90s, it became popular in the church to say, feelings aren't right or wrong, they just are. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <clears throat> Lots of feelings are wrong. We feel a lot of wrong things. Well, I mean, if, if I feel like I want to punch Chris in the face, that's wrong. There is no place that that's right. We, I, 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 he's bigger than me. I wouldn't do it anyways. <laughs> The psalmists prayed through their doubts. We need to pray to God. Talk to God about our doubts. I wish we had time to read Psalm 73. We don't. Go back and read Psalm 73 and look at some of the things he pours out to God. Secondly, we got to go to Scripture. Remember when Jesus was in the desert and Satan's trying to tempt him with what? Doubts. What did he say to him? If you're really the son of God, you can turn the stones into bread. If you're really the son of God, you can jump off the temple and God will catch you. If you're, he was trying to tempt Jesus with doubt. And we know what Jesus did. He quoted scripture back to Satan and he obeyed those scriptures. See, the demons study us. And when did it say Satan did after Jesus quoted the three scriptures? He left him until a more opportune time. The demons study you and me. And when we take a stand against them, they go away and they come back in our weak moments. And they whisper in our ears things that they know will make us doubt. If we listen, we're fools. If we pretend their doubts aren't there, we're fools. And if we come in unarmed, we try and fight the devil without scripture, it's like going to a gunfight with a stick. We can't stand up to Satan without scripture. That's what Jesus did. That's what we need to do. Next, you need to talk to somebody. What did John do? He went to Jesus. He said, send the guys and ask Jesus, are you the right guy? Sometimes we're afraid to look weak. If we confess our doubts, I'm going to look weak. People will look down on me. Listen, if Thomas, uh, Moses, Abraham, John the Baptist all had doubts, I guarantee you, whoever you talk to about your doubts has had them too. Because I don't think any of us are greater than those people. You're not going to blow their minds but they are going to help you find answers. And maybe they've struggled with the same doubts you have 
or they know someone who has. And you can talk it out and you can pray about it. And if you've never had a doubt, don't worry, you're probably safe and don't, and God will take care of you. Um, never mind. <laughs> but your search for answers to your doubts, that was a, shoot, that, all right. <sighs> your search for answers and doubts isn't going to answer every question. But talking about it can help you get back to all the reasons you do trust God and why God is trustworthy. Next, take a reality check. Sometimes we know in our head what's right. We know intellectually God is there, but we don't feel his presence. Our mind, we know he hasn't gone anywhere, but we feel like he's left us. And we just have to say, okay, this is just a feeling. I'm feeling this. Feelings stink. I don't like this feeling. Feelings are right or wrong. No, some feelings are wrong. So you just you say, okay, it's just a feeling. I don't have to go with it. Lastly, we need to... Uh, that last yeah um be honest and consider the alternative to trusting god i said what it's so hard to trust god that's true try not trusting god that's worse think of every problem you have in your life everything that makes you doubt everything that makes you struggle take god out abandon god and see if that problem gets better i have relationship problems if god is not at the center of my life Will my relationships get better or worse? We know the answer. I have money problems. Hey, if God's not the center of my life, is my finances going to get better or worse? We know how we spend money without God. Evil and suffering in the world. I don't like the way God's running the world. Okay, there's no God. Now what's your answer for evil and suffering in the world? You don't have one. If serving in God's kingdom is hard, try being self-focused. And see if your life gets better or worse. Serving is hard. Being selfish is harder. And it worked out for our Bible heroes, didn't it? Thomas doubted, but he was open about it. He dealt with it, said, my Lord and my God, and went on to be a great hero of the faith who preached in India and died a martyr's death. Peter, Jesus said to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And you know what? That wasn't the last time Peter doubted. Three times. I don't know the man. The night of the crucifixion. And yet he got over that. And just five, seven weeks later. He preached to 3,000 people at Pentecost. And 10 years later. Preached to Cornelius and the first Gentiles. He, he, he had doubts many times. Overcame them. Faith is trust. We should trust people have been, who have proven to be trustworthy. My wife, Fern, has proven for over 30 years. To be very trustworthy. And if she does something... I don't understand. It doesn't shake my trust in her. It doesn't shake my faith in her because I know she loves me. I know she loves God. And I know she has my best interests at heart. If she does one thing that seems contrary to that, uh, I know her well enough that I can trust her. God has proven himself again and again. And the perfect answer to doubts is found in the father of the demon possessed boy in Mark chapter 9. Verse 15, Mark chapter 9, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. <sighs> oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long Shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him and the spirit saw Jesus and immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you could do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, if everything is possible for him who believes. Now get this. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down. The disciples were arguing. They couldn't heal the boy even though they had the power to do it. And he says, look, if you can help me, please. 
And he says, if, if, I don't think you fully understand who I am. Everything is possible. And what he said was brilliant. He goes, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. It almost sounds schizophrenic. I, I do believe, but I also don't believe. And isn't that all of us? We have faith and we have doubts simultaneously. He just says it. He goes, look, I've got some faith. I don't have enough faith. Help me. Faith is not ignoring the facts and just believing. Faith is seeking the facts, embracing them, addressing our doubts, and then holding on to our beliefs and letting our faith become stronger. We test our faith, it survives, and it makes us stronger. It's up to us to face our doubts, address them, and then and only then we can forget them and we can move on to greater things. Amen. Amen. All right, now we're going to take the Lord's Supper. You know, sometimes, as I said, we know that God's there intellectually, but we don't feel his presence. We know he hasn't gone anywhere, but we can feel like he left us. And Jesus understands this. When Jesus hung on the cross, he didn't just feel like God abandoned him. God did abandon him. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was because he was bearing the sins of the whole world on him. And God had to turn his back on him. He felt total separation from God because he was totally separated from God, carrying your sins and my sins. And one thing that helps us with our doubts is when we take the Lord's Supper. Because it reminds us how real God is. Jesus died on the cross for you and me. That means we know that God loves us. We don't have to doubt it. When our feelings, we don't feel loved, we remember the cross and we know how much our Father in heaven loves us. And then Jesus rose from the dead three days later. And when we doubt, does God really exist? Is he really true? Is he really powerful? We know all the evidence there was for the resurrection. It's like, yes, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He made the ultimate sacrifice to prove it to us. That's the beauty of the Lord's Supper. We can remember the things that help us overcome our doubts. I'm going to pray for the bread. Then in a minute, we'll pray for the cup. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the body.